Hello everyone and welcome to this lecture on cultural environments for international business. Uh, today we're going to be covering a number of issues regarding how culture and business interact and how culture influences the general environment for business as well as um, some of the other environments, the political and legal environment and the economic environment. Let's start out with a brief discussion of what culture is. Uh, this is a term that's used in many different contexts and there are many different definitions out there. I'm sure that you've looked at this in some detail in other classes. We're going to look at, a, at several different definitions here. First, let's think about culture as a set of traditional beliefs and values that are transmitted and shared within a society. Okay, one of the things that you recognize from that definition is that culture depends on a social structure. So culture is not an individual characteristic, it is a group characteristic. It's how people interact with each other. Uh, it describes how people interact with each other and not just their interactions but their underlying beliefs and values. Um, so uh, beliefs and values are a key part of what composes culture um, and then uh, traditional in that there is some degree of permanence, not, well, it's not that culture can't change. We'll look at how cultures change, certainly here in a minute. Um, cultures are always changing, but there is uh, some degree of carryover in those beliefs and values across generations. In fact, the next definition that we'll look at here is a total way of life and thought patterns passed from generation to generation. Okay, so culture is fairly broad and all-encompassing in terms of this way of life aspect of things. As human beings, we are constantly confronting and solving problems of everyday living uh, and have been for thousands and hundreds of thousands of years, well, tens of thousands of years at least uh, with our species. Um, so, um, uh, you know, just simple problems like uh, how can we shelter ourselves from the elements? Uh, how can we nourish ourselves? What types of foods uh, are we able to get to sustain ourselves, um, what type of clothing to wear. Those, are, those become cultural issues in that uh, people, as they solve those problems in uh, unique ways in different parts of the world, um, they, they do so within the context of their belief, beliefs and value systems. And, and so that way of life, that way of doing things is passed on that, oh yes, here's the answer, here's the best way of doing things that becomes embedded in the culture. And then the thought patterns in terms of here is how to think about these issues, here's how to think about other people, here's how to think about yourself, here's how to think about the world around you, those thought patterns and interpretations of external stimuli are also um, created and sustained and then passed on from generation to generation as, as parents and others in the society um, teach the younger people how, how to approach life. Okay, um, another definition that I really like comes from Gerrit Hofstede, who we'll talk about more here in a few minutes. Um, he's a preeminent researcher in, um, uh, in culture and its connection to, the, to business um, and did some of the groundbreaking early work in this particular area. Hofstede talks about culture as the software of the mind. So that's a fair, very simple and straightforward way of conceiving uh, all of those elements of the previous two definitions there. Um, that culture is a filter through which we process the things that we encounter around us. And so it, it's basically a set of programming instruction, instructions. We're programmed with our culture. Our culture helps us to interpret, interpret and make sense of the world around us um, as a software program might. Okay, well, um, why do we bother studying culture in a business class? Well, um, certainly a natural fit in an international business class because uh, we're dealing, as we've talked about before, with everything that crosses boundaries. And those boundaries aren't just geographic, but those boundaries are also cultural. As we cross cultural boundaries, there is additional complexity and additional challenges that arise uh, for the business person. And in order to improve our skill in interacting with people from other cultures, then we need to increase our 
levels of cultural competence. Um, we're going to conceive of cultural competence here in terms of a number of, of different levels of progression. At the first level, we start out with open attitudes, and this is absolutely critical for any kind of cross-cultural success. In fact, going the other way, most cultural failure, most cross-cultural interaction failure, has at its heart the lack of open attitudes, or in other words, closed attitudes. I've seen this many times with people. Uh, some people have naturally open and accepting attitudes towards other cultures, and some people just don't. It becomes more difficult for some people. Um, for those people, cross-cultural interaction is a real challenge, whether it's just due to lack of experience or whether it's due to uh, biases that, that have been uh, introduced earlier in their lives. Um, or, you know, I mean, we could speculate psychologically on a number of different things, um, but there are people who have a challenge in this regard, that they, uh, that their attitude is fairly closed towards new cross-cultural ki kinds of experiences, and that makes it very difficult. If you start out with that attitude, if you start out with a closed attitude towards other cultures, then your ability to interact effectively with people from those cultures is going to be severely limited. So, uh, in order to meet the goal of interacting effectively, it's important to come to the process with an open attitude, uh, with an attitude that is not based on uh, bias or prejudgment um, or um, you know in any of those kinds of things. You have to realize that. Um, the other person's way of doing things is potentially as equally valid as the way that you do things. And, and that's where I think some of the closed attitudes come because there's a natural human tendency to think that our solutions for these common life problems and our beliefs and our value systems are inherently superior to all others. And that's where the, the closed attitude starts to develop. Um, if we can put that aside and be open enough to recognize that other people's values, other people's experiences, um, other people's interpretation of, of the world could be equally valid. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to say that, you know, we don't have to say that other people's values and beliefs are better than ours. That would be kind of a, a reverse uh, cultural attitude, reverse discrimination of cultures. So, so we're, not, we're not, you know, we don't want, we don't want it to go either way. It's not that uh, our culture is better than others or that other cultures are better than ours. Uh, it's that there are differences, those differences are valid, and it's perfectly okay for human beings to have different approaches, different attitudes, different attitudes, different beliefs, um, different value systems, and different ways of doing things. They aren't inherently better or worse. At least we have to keep the possibility open for that. Sure, after we have some interaction, there are going to be things that we really like about our own culture and things that we um, don't like about our own culture. There are going to be other things that we really like about other cultures and things that we don't like about other cultures. So it's fine. I, I'm not saying you have to have no opinion at all and just be completely objective and open-minded. Uh, but um, it's important to start with that open attitude to be willing to accept the validity of other perspectives. That, that's all you need, really. And and an interest in learning about those perspectives. Whether they ultimately match your values and beliefs or not is a different issue, but you have to be open to learning about them and open to the idea that they are valid and acceptable for the people that hold them. All right, well, um, after the open attitudes part comes self and other awareness. I alluded to this just a second ago with the open attitudes because um, in my experience, in the experience of many people, I'm sure you've, many of you have had this same experience, as we immerse ourselves in another culture, we often learn not only about that other culture, but we learn a lot more about our own culture. There are so many things that we go through our daily lives within our own cultural context, and, and we don't question the things around us. So we don't, since the values and beliefs are widely held among those that we associate with, uh, we tend not to question those things. We just accept them as a given, and there's no contrast to provide any kind of questioning of those things. As we go into a new cultural climate with new attitudes, new values and beliefs, 
new perspectives on how to do things. Our minds are opened not only to those new perspectives, but also to those unstated assumptions that had been governing, governing our thoughts, to the software code behind our interpretation of the world that previously was somewhat invisible or hidden from us. You know, we start looking uh, at the code uh, to figure out, you know, what what kinds of things are there that we didn't didn't know were there previously. We just accepted as a given. That's just how things are. Um, so self and other awareness. As we become aware of others in other cultures, we become more aware of our own culture and our own self. All right, that's an important step. And uh, then as we progress further, we develop a deeper cultural knowledge. And this goes to the level of things like learning other languages, um, uh, learning more about the culture through experience and interaction such that we are able to um, uh, interact on a deeper level. We know more of the history. We know um, uh, of uh, you know, what, what it is that what experiences have formed the culture and, and have, have influenced the attitudes and the values and beliefs that we see uh, exhibited within that culture commonly. Um, so that's that deeper cultural knowledge. We can recognize some surface differences initially, but uh, going below that surface and having that historical background, having having more experience and interaction, and, and the language is a big piece of this if, if there are different languages involved. Um, that That's a, another big step as we increase our levels of cultural competence. All right, and then this leads us to a place where uh, we start developing some effective cross-cultural skills. Uh, we really have to have those other pieces in place, the open attitudes, the self and other awareness, and the cultural knowledge before our effectiveness in cross-cultural interactions can really begin to be realized. Um, it's not that, that we're going to be totally ineffective without those components, but as we put those components together, they build on each other, and we add that to our experience over time, and then we're able to develop these cross-cultural skills, which are transferable. So uh, even if your uh, deeper cultural knowledge is specific to one particular culture, let's say, you know, in my case, um, I grew up uh, on the Texas-Mexico border in El Paso, Texas, I graduated from high school there, had a lot of interaction with the Hispanic population in El Paso, as well as across the border with the Mexican population in Juarez. Um, and uh, through those interactions, developed some of these things, the, the open attitudes, self and other awareness, and um, some, some limited deeper cultural knowledge. I wouldn't say that it was a hugely deep cultural knowledge as a, as a uh, young teenager, but, um, but began to get, get a good sense of some things. Those skills, being able to interact across these cultural um, barriers or boundaries, uh, are transferable so that a few years later, I moved to Norway. I lived in Norway for two years. And I, I think because of my previous experiences, I was able to transfer some of those skills. And I was able to adjust much more quickly to the Norwegian culture and interacting with Norwegian people, even as I was learning the language and the deeper cultural knowledge there, which uh, you know, early on I didn't have as much of a sense of, but a as I uh, developed more cultural knowledge there, um, I was able to draw on my past experiences to better relate to a new culture that I had not experienced before. Um, so that's what I mean by transferable, that even uh, you know, developing that deep cultural knowledge in one culture can help you to effectively interact across other cultures as well, even if you don't have the deeper knowledge at that time of the other cultures. Uh, there are a lot of different ways of measuring this ability to interact across cultures. Across cultures, um, One uh, perspective that I think is very interesting and worth talking about some is uh, from Livermore and Van Dyne. Uh, they have developed this notion of cultural intelligence, and they've actually put together some instruments to measure your cultural intelligence or develop a CQ score, as they call it. Um, I'm just going to highlight, you can, you can look up on your own um, some of those things that they have done and some of the instruments um, that have been uh, produced in this area. There are some online tests and things. Um, 
there are some consulting companies that use this uh, quite extensively and, and they do charge for um, their instruments and everything. So you can do it personally if you would like um, or uh, you can, you know, of course have them work with your company um, as well. But uh, just looking at the concepts here right now behind this cultural intelligence um, idea, um, they've developed, uh, they have identified rather four different aspects to cultural intelligence that they measure in their instruments. Uh, the first is CQ drive, um, and that is based on your interest in experiencing other cultures. So it maps quite well to the open attitudes element that I was just talking about. How interested and open are you to experiencing other cultures? Do you like ethnic food? Do you, do you like to watch foreign films? Do you like travel? and visiting other countries and uh, do you have friends that are from other countries or do you seek out people that come from different kinds of cultural backgrounds um, all that kind of thing builds into your CQ drive CQ knowledge is another dimension of this concept and um, this is what you know about other cultures both general and specific so this maps with what we were just talking about with your cultural knowledge your deeper level of cultural knowledge um, so ha do you study other languages? Do you know much about the history of other countries and other cultures? Uh, do you not know much about uh, the aesthetic systems, the art, um, the music, those kinds of things from other countries and cultures, um, especially those that are quite different from your own? All right, uh, now this one is a really good one that goes to the heart of the interaction across cultures, which is CQ strategy. Now they define this as thinking about cultural differences in advance of a cross-cultural encounter. So if you know you have a cross-cultural encounter coming up, how readily do you think about and plan for that cross-cultural encounter? Um, do you um, uh, do you realize that you know there could be some differences? Do you try to anticipate those differences? Do you um, uh, try to clarify your assumptions going into that? And can you adjust your mental maps uh, during the encounter um, if you meet things that don't quite match with your expectations? Because that's another key point. I guess we'll emphasize this as we go along. But sometimes we might encounter things in individuals uh, from a different cultural background that are different from what we had been led to expect from that cultural group. There are a number of reasons why that could happen. Again, we'll go into that more in a, you know, in a few minutes. Uh, but um, CQ strategy then is about how, uh, how much mental effort do we put into these cross-cultural interactions. Not that we want to get bogged down in, in uh, uh, analyzing and reanalyzing and, and st strategizing. We want things to flow fairly naturally, but it's important to have cross-cultural success, it's important to have the skills of questioning our assumptions, um, being able to uh, to um, adapt to the situation based on some pre-thought-out strategies, um, and, and then be, uh, and, and particularly as we are in the middle of an interaction, are we readily able to change our strategies if it appears that they're ineffective or if some of our assumptions prove to be incorrect? Uh, which brings us to the very last one, which is the actual action. Um, CQ action, where we are making changes to both verbal and nonverbal behaviors to facilitate more effective interactions. So to what extent, okay, the strategizing is kind of in advance of the, uh, of the interaction. I, I guess I got a little carried away on that, um, moving into the interaction itself. When we're in the cross-cultural interaction, how successful are we at making those changes now this could be based on our previous strategizing um, and there are some very simple things that we might do um, if we're dealing in a situation where we're speaking with someone who, uh, whose native language is different from our own but we're speaking in English for example. So uh, if I'm speaking to a non-native English speaker, um, I may adjust my speech patterns slightly, I may speak more slowly, um, I may change my word choice slightly. I may avoid the use of idioms or other expressions that might be difficult for them to understand. I might make those changes to facilitate the communication 
and to make it easier for them. Now, some things, some big mistakes. Do not speak louder. Just because someone doesn't speak your same language doesn't mean that they are hard of hearing. That's a common mistake. Uh, people sometimes, if they feel like they're not being understood, rather than trying those other strategies of speaking more slowly or uh, choosing words more carefully, they might speak more loudly, <laughs> which accomplishes absolutely nothing other than offending the person that you are that you are communicating with. Okay, so it's not about uh, we have to make the right changes as we are communicating across cultural boundaries. It's not just about making any change. Some changes could actually make the situation worse and, and become offensive and, and uh, be perceived as, um, as not helpful. Um, and another thing is extreme simplification of the language. Um, that's usually not appreciated. Again, the person is not uh, lacking in intelligence uh, you don't need to speak to them as you might speak to a very young child or a baby. Uh, you don't resort to baby talk with someone who does not uh, speak your language. You just want to be more straightforward, uh, speak more slowly, enunciate more clearly, and uh, try different phrases and different words. Um, and also, uh, it's also very effective to, to repeat back and forth a little bit just to clarify to make sure that there's understanding. Uh, so when someone you know, is communicating something to you, you repeat back to them what you understood, um, and then they can repeat back to you what they understood. And so that's another good technique to enhance communication when there are some language barriers. Um, Nonverbal behaviors as well come into play, so it's not just about verbal communication, but what kinds of nonverbal cues are we giving and or is, our, is the other person giving to us? Uh, they may be... If they seem to be um, giving off a very cold, unreceptive body language, uh, then there might be a problem with something that we're doing or something that we're saying. We need to question that and maybe make some adjustments uh, to try to get over whatever barrier has come up uh, because that's an indication that there's some cross-cultural misunderstanding going on. Maybe we're being offensive without realizing it, and we need to take a good look at ourselves and our behavior and, and our appearance, perhaps, or, or the situation itself uh, in terms of sometimes the ages of the people involved or the, uh, or the genders or um, uh, the position in, ter in the social hierarchy. All those things can, inter can influence an interaction and can pose barriers for some kinds of interactions in some kinds of, of cultures. Um, so we need to be sensitive to those kinds of things and try different approaches uh, to until we find one that seems to be more effective. But body language is key. If we get that uh, negative body language, it's important to not just plow forward or not amp up what we're doing, but to try different approaches, try to make adjustments so that uh, there's a more warm reception. And then we need to be careful also on our body language. Are we giving a, a cold body language, a negative body language back to the other person? And if so, why? What is it about what they are doing that is uncomfortable for us? Um, hopefully they can pick up on some of those nonverbal cues as well. And then both parties can adjust to each other and, and, and make for a more comfortable interaction. Okay, well that's cultural intelligence. Um, the iceberg model of culture is a common way of viewing culture. Uh, as you can see from this picture of an iceberg, um, icebergs certainly have a surface component, but they also have an under the surface component. And because of the laws of physics and the density of water versus the density of ice, the portion under the surface is larger than the portion on the top of the surface. So the old expression, the tip of the iceberg, means that you're not really seeing the whole thing. You're only seeing a small part of it. And with culture, uh, that which we see on the surface is only a small part of it. And there's much more down below the surface that may be unseen uh, that's not com completely evidenced. So when we look at the model more carefully here, we see the above the surface kinds of things in culture are the, the immediately communicated differences. Um, we, see, we can uh, see differences in 
in music, art, food and drink, uh, those kinds of things, or cultural norms of greeting, uh, ways of dressing. Um, some of these things are, are not as prominent anymore. Uh, things like dress um, are, are not as culturally based. It's a little bit more universal. Um, even greetings, manners, rituals, some of those things are more universal. Um, but there are still significant things that, that um, are inherent to some cultures that, that could create some problems if we're not aware of them. But these are surface-based things. Um, when we are preparing, this goes back to our strategy CQ score, when we're preparing for cross-cultural interaction, we should do some preliminary research on these kinds of things, particularly manners, rituals, outward behaviors, um, and make sure that we are able to comply with the cultural norms of the person that we're about to interact with. Or at least that even if we don't comply fully, it's not like we're going to be uh, just like someone would be if they were from that culture, but we need to at least avoid those uh, offensive behaviors um, that go contrary to those um, manners and rituals and, and behaviors accepted by that culture. Okay, so again, um, you know, there are a lot of examples of a quick one that is often in, in a lot of the literature, uh, things like um, in many Middle Eastern cultures, it's uh, sitting on the floor is very common. So you may sit on either very low furniture or on the floor when you're in a business meeting or other kind of encounter, uh, but it is considered rude to display the soles of your feet to the person or people that you are interacting with. So uh, just posi positioning your body in such a way uh, that you are able to maintain um, a, a good uh, foot position in, in what is maybe an unnatural position for some people that aren't used to sitting on the floor or sitting in low, very low furniture, uh, that can be a little bit of a challenge. So it might be something to practice in advance of, of an encounter uh, to maybe understand a little bit more and, and realize how you're going to um, approach that. Um, another example might be um, something as simple as in, in many Asian cultures, um, uh, Japan, for example, um, Bowing is an important part of the ritual greeting, and there are certain norms to the bowing. So, uh, you know, whether you bow lower than the person that you are meeting depends on the relative status of, of yourself versus that person and the mutual recognition of that status. The person with the higher status should not bow as low as the person with the lower status, although sometimes if it's uncertain what the status is, both people as a cultural courtesy and as a show of deference, may try to out-bow the other person. Uh, you might have seen this before, or maybe even experienced it, each trying to bow multiple times to try to get to the right level. And one person bows lower, the other person bows even lower, then the other person bows even lower, and so forth. So uh, anyway, getting comfortable with that kind of a ritual, that kind of an outward behavior, is an important part of that strategizing before cross-cultural interaction. Understanding those things is good, but those above-the-surface things are not nearly as significant as the below-the-surface things, which have to do with the actual value orientation that people face. So there are all different kinds of dimensions upon which those values can vary. And we see a list here on the slide of a number of different um, orientations. We can pick any of those and, and elaborate further. I won't take a lot of time to go through all of those, um, but uh, something like time, for example. Um, time is a key variable and cultures have different perspectives on time. First, on the concept of time itself. Some cultures have a very linear view of time, such as in the United States. We tend to have a very linear view of time. So we view, culture, we, we view time as a timeline, uh, everything in a chrono chronological sequence. This happened in 1776, and then in 1787, uh, you know, the, the Constitution was signed. And 1776 was the Declaration of Independence, 1787 this. Uh, by 1812, we had another conflict with the British, and then, um, you know, we had these other events, and then finally in the 20th century, and now in the 21st century. And, and history is a progression of time along a linear uh, 
line that linear line uh, it's redundant but <laughs> there's a line history is a line that stretches into the past and out into the future and one event builds on another event and, and the past influences the future and sometimes it's repeated on that line but uh, mostly we just try to learn lessons from the past as we move into the future in a chronological sequence. Other cultures don't see time that way at all. From a philosophical standpoint, they see time as not linear but circular so that time repeats itself. So that there are all kinds of cycles of time. We have a daily cycles of time. The sun rises and the sun sets. We have monthly cycles as the moon goes around the earth and the moon goes through different phases and that has connotations and and, um, and importance as those cycles of, of the seasons um, go from one to the other and the years from one to the other but they're all interrelated and where it's part of a of a more holistic view so rather than stretching it out as a line it's a circle in which time repeats itself and that human beings uh, don't necessarily influence uh, the march of history, but human beings are a part of a broader picture of events and circumstances and natural surroundings that um, have been repeating themselves for for uh, for as long as anyone can possibly conceive in the past and will continue to repeat themselves as long as anyone can possibly conceive into the future. In fact, future and past meld into this present flow of cycles. So there's not nearly the distinction between past and future. Um, things are much more focused on the present. So that's it's just a, an example of value orientation towards time that would greatly affect someone's thinking. In a business sense, uh, you can understand where uh, someone with a, a more uh, circular view of time would not feel pressured by time, uh, would not feel constrained by time, because time to, to think that time is a limited resource is is not conceivable. And under a circular view, time is a renewable resource that is always coming back. And you don't have a limited amount of time. You have an infinite amount of time. There, there's no such thing as an amount of time anyway. It's just part of a cycle of things. And so there's, no, there's not nearly as much urgency to have things done right now or by this time or do this first so that this can happen next and then that can happen next so that we can progress and get better and go into this you know new future uh, that's not part of the conception conception is it's fine how it is this is how it has been this is how it will be we're part of a flow of things that are interconnected and interrelated and it's going to we're going to have other opportunities to come back around if we miss this opportunity we'll just get back on the next time it comes around uh, so that changes an approach to business uh, very dramatically, and it's it can become a real challenge then for someone from a, a linear background to interact with someone from a circular background, um, and and try to line up those interests and line up those those value systems in a way that's productive for both sides. It's going to require a lot more patience on the side of the linear uh, time orientation as you're dealing with the more circular time orientation. Okay, well we could go through all of those value orientations and um, do a similar um, comparison. Uh, most of those are a continuum from, from two different things, but sometimes there are multiple views. It might not be just a continuum between two things, but maybe there are three or four or five different distinct ways of approaching a certain value um, that um, will affect you know, the interaction. We'll talk about a few more of these here in a minute. Um, I spoke a minute ago about nonverbal language being important. There are all kinds of nonverbal aspects to cross-cultural communication. Uh, again, there's a, a big list here. Um, you can think of a number of examples. Um, I particularly like, in a business sense, down towards the end of the list, these become important. Superstition, color, and gifts often uh, have an implication on marketing decisions. So as we're thinking about you know, what kind of packaging we're going to have for our product or what kind of design we're going to have with the product, uh, what, what color is the product going to be, that colors have connotations, but those 
connotations are different culture to culture. So some cultures may associate uh, black with death, for example. Uh, when you have a funeral, everyone wears black to mourn the deceased. In other cultures, white would be the color associated with death, and everyone would wear white to mourn at a funeral, um, or to see, would see that, see white as the, uh, uh, as the color designating death. Um, an experience that I had personally um, a few years ago, I traveled to China with a group of students and other faculty members. Um, this was not at Shippensburg, this was while I was teaching at West Virginia University, so I'll blame it on, on West Virginia University. And, um, uh, at WVU, actually, there is, uh, in the business school there, there is a center for Chinese business, and that's what I was involved with uh, while there. Um, that was, that organized this trip to China. Uh, uh, it's a really great trip. Um, we met with a lot of um, alumni from our program, uh, as well as other Chinese leaders, government leaders, business leaders. Um, and um, so, so it was great, but uh, we brought a bunch of gifts. We knew that uh, it would be important to, you know, show our respect to those that we were meeting with by, by providing a gift. And so we had a couple of uh, different suitcases of gifts. Uh, one suitcase was full of these very nice desk clocks. In fact, uh, I think I have a... Uh, okay, well, this is not the actual clock. Um, this was a different desk clock, but this is a, an example of a clock that I was given as a gift for my service on a, a little dusty on the top there, time to dust my clock. This is an example of a clock that I was given uh, for service on a board of directors for a nonprofit. Um, but this is very similar to the clock that we gave as a gift to these Chinese associates. Uh, it said West Virginia University Center for Chinese Business and uh, we thought, hey, this is a very nice gift. Um, most people would like to get that. It's nice to display on your desk and just a, a nice memento. Well, uh, the first few people that we gave those to reacted kind of strangely. So again, being sensitive to the reactions, to the nonverbal reactions of people, we could tell through their nonverbal, they didn't say anything outright, but we could tell through their nonverbal reactions that they weren't quite as happy to get this gift as we thought they might be. They didn't seem to appreciate it very much. Um, after a, uh, this experience was repeated a few times with a few different people, um, we did have a, uh, a graduate student, a Chinese graduate student with us on the trip, and uh, he pulled uh, someone aside, one of the other faculty members, and explained that um, in China, um, giving a clock as a gift is generally considered a bad idea because it um, communicates the message to the person that you're giving it to that their life is coming to an end, that their clock is ticking and the clock is a symbol of death because their time is running out. Um, and so that that would not be an appropriate gift and that might explain some of the cold reaction that we were getting from people. Uh, so we stopped giving those gifts when we, when we learned that and fortunately we did have another suitcase full of gifts that was full of John Denver CDs. And John Denver in the 70s had come to China and become a big star. And every time we pulled out a John Denver CD, uh, people's faces would light up and they would launch into their rendition of Country Roads. And uh, so that was very successful. Um, people appreciated that gift very much. Okay, so um, you have to be careful about what those connotations are. Sometimes you get unexpected outcomes um, from connotations that you're not aware of but are rooted in those cultural perceptions. Uh, just some characteristics of culture. Um, we've talked about some of these things already. Culture is prescriptive meaning, and this is what creates some of the danger behind culture. Um, prescriptive means that culture is about shoulds. This is how you should do things. Um, and that has a tendency to, to close people's attitudes. If they think that well, this is how it should be done and you're not doing it that way, then obviously you're wrong and I'm right. And so culture has some inherent bias built in there and we have to get over that prescriptive nature of culture as we develop those open attitudes in, in, in order to communicate more effectively. Uh, we've talked about some of these other things. It's socially shared. Culture is a great facilitator of communication. We think of culture 
as a barrier to communication, which it is when we're communicating across cultures, but think about how effective culture is as a facilitator of communication within our culture. That's precisely why it's a barrier across cultures. Um, you may have had this experience, I've had this experience a number of times, when you're traveling overseas in a foreign environment uh, where you feel a little bit uncomfortable, you're, you're, you're by yourself or with a small group and you're surrounded by people uh, that have a different cultural background than you or have a different language and everything is just you know a little bit out of sync and then you happen to meet another person from your country so uh, you might meet someone and, and if it's even closer to home like I, I might be walking down the street uh, somewhere in uh, uh, let's say in the Czech Republic and um, although I'm starting to feel more comfortable there since I didn't since I go there every year, but um, uh, but but again, just for ex example, um, if if I'm walking down the street in, in uh, Prague and I happen to meet somebody, and I and uh, for some reason we you know we, we talk to each other, and it turns out they're from Philadelphia, and I suddenly have this cultural bond with them, and I'm suddenly able to communicate so much more easily with that person, and so I open up to that person very quickly, even though they're a complete stranger to me, uh, but uh, it just uh, facilitates communication between us immediately that we have shared experiences shared values fair, shared beliefs or the assumption of that uh, even though we don't know for sure that that all exists but we immediately both assume that we have these these shared experiences and and then we're able to communicate much more easily than I could with with the other people that I'm around um, and that's a little bit odd in a way because if I happen to be in Philadelphia on business and I'm walking down the street I'm not going to have this instant kismet connection with some random person on the street, I'm not even going to probably look at them or talk to them very much. But if it happens to be in another cultural context, it's just amazing how quickly that uh, that common cultural bond can lead to effective communication and, and trust and, and uh, in that circumstance. I've got several stories going a little bit longer on this lecture than I wanted to, but I've got several stories uh, about that where I've, where uh, uh, Americans have, have helped each other out, including me being helped out by a, a fellow American in a foreign environment um, who was otherwise a total stranger, but uh, but was um, was ultimately was able to be very helpful and and, um, and and was able to understand my situation more quickly uh, than they would have had they not been of of my same cultural background. Okay. Anyway, um, so we can look at those other characteristics of culture as well. Um, I guess the, I want to call just brief attention before I go on to the, to the culture is enduring aspect and culture is dynamic. Those might seem to be contradictory, but culture is full of some contradictions. Culture is, is both enduring and dynamic. So culture does change, but it does stay the same. Certain aspects of culture stay the same. Uh, certain aspects of culture change. Culture can change generationally from one generation to the next. Uh, culture can change regionally uh, as people develop regional differences. There are all kinds of ways in which culture changes over time based on other influences. Uh, but at its heart, culture maintains certain things from the past into the present as with uh, these underlying belief structures. So otherwise it would be just kind of all over the place. Um, so. So it seems contradictory, but um, it's actually uh, very common for culture to be both changing and the same. And there, there's often, that's a source of tension in many cultures, is to what degree should we allow culture to change, or is culture changing too fast? Um, should it change more slowly or not change at all? There are those that would rather have culture not change at all. And there are others that feel like there are certain things about culture that should change. Uh, so it's a, it's a source of social tension. All right, I mentioned Gerrit Hofstede before. Hofstede, in his research work, identified initially in his studies four cultural dimensions, uh, which are very helpful in understanding culture, um, the basis of culture. He has expanded that in subsequent work. Uh, now you'll usually see six dimensions listed in Hofstede's work, or those that have followed Hofstede. There are also other typologies and cultural dimensions uh, that other researchers have proposed, um, but it's worth looking at Hofstede's. And one of the things I would like you to do, 
uh, you've seen this on the syllabus, is I'd like you to go to Hofstede's website. It's actually gert-hofstede.com. Gert um, now, uh, the interesting story on this, and I don't want to go too long on this lecture, but uh, someone else started this website, not Garrett Hofstede. He had his own website, and then somebody else started this other website. It turned out the other website was actually better than his own website. Uh, and then he, he got upset, and anyway, they worked it out, and now they're combined, and uh, some of the good elements of the other website are incorporated into what he was trying to do, too. So anyway, it's a useful resource. One of the things I really like on that website is that you can go in and select any country, well, at least countries that Hofstede has researched, and... Um, you can see the scores that Hofstede has found in his research for these cultural dimensions. So Hofstede's whole approach was to try to um, use surveys to study people's values and then to be able to translate those into numerical uh, symbols or numerical values, the, the cultural values into numerical values and then compare on the basis of those numbers these differences between cultures. It's a great concept. Um, there's a lot of validity to that approach um, and so I encourage you to go to that website and play around with that, look at different cultures. I'm going to show you an example here in just a minute. Um, now the dimensions themselves, you can look this up. I don't want to go through, um, through detailed definitions of them. Uh, some of them are a little bit more intuitive than others. Let's take an indiv individualism, for example, is a continuum between you know, focus on uh, the individual and focus on the collective or collectivism versus individualism. So to what extent does a society um, reward individual achievement versus attribute uh, achievement to a group process? Um, that's just one aspect of it. But in a, in a business climate, that's a very important aspect of it. Uh, do you emphasize individual achievement versus collective achievement? Do you have an employee of the month that gets recognized and rewarded for outstanding contributions, or do you recognize the entire group together? In a collective cult collectivist culture, it would be highly insulting to single out a single employee and give them special accolades and rewards for their contributions. Uh, that, that would be culturally inappropriate. You want to emphasize the group achievements not the individual achievements. Okay, well, um, let's look at uh, what we might see on a comparison from Hofstede's research. Uh, this is the United States compared with Japan. So the United States is the darker gray and Japan is the lighter blue um, on these different cultural dimensions. And you can see on, uh, well, let's start with power distance. Power distance is how comfortable are we um, with differences in, in hierarchical structure within a society. So in a business sense, um, how much do we associate with our boss? Do we call our boss by his or her first name? Would we go out socially with our boss? Or is there more of a distance between uh, those hierarchical positions? So, um, he, uh, and zero is very low power distance, 100 is very high. So zero is that you are super good chums with your boss and there's no difference at all between a boss and an employee's. And 100 would be very large power distance that you would never, ever associate with your boss in a social setting. You would never question the boss. You would never uh, be uh, informal with the boss in any way. All right, well, uh, both the United States and, and Japan are a little bit on the low side on power distance, but the United States particularly low at 31, and Japan higher at 46. So there's more power distance in, within Japanese culture than within American culture. Now look at the individualism score. Individualism score. Um, I mentioned that 100 is the top score. Well, the United States gets a perfect 100 there. Uh, Japan is much more collectivist with a 47. So that's a significant difference. If we are strategizing on how are we going to interact with Japanese colleagues, we have to understand that an American approach is going to be biased towards the individual and a Japanese approach is going to be biased towards the collective. So. Um, when you're working with teams and groups, uh, you have to balance that out and, uh, and, and try to integrate uh, that cultural attitude into the approach. Masculinity, um, it's a little bit about you know, how males are treated versus females or how males treat females and what opportunities are there for females, that kind of thing. Um, 
but it's also about what is valued in the society. Um, a masculine view is much more materialistic. It's about things. It's about tangible things. Uh, whereas a female view is more about relationships, kind of more, you know, uh, the touchy feely side of things. Like, um, you know, how are people thinking about it? What are what are people's feelings? What are the different, um, uh, you know, attitudes that people might have, or how do we take that into account? Um, so that that's another aspect of the masculinity and femininity. Japan gets a perfect hundred on the masculinity side. So going back to the conceptions of the, uh, well, um, of the Shinto, uh, you know, there's, there's some Shinto religious things that are, actually I'm stepping back from that a little bit, but um, the, I'm sorry, not, I didn't mean Shinto, I meant samurai. <laughs> that's the, that's the, the uh, stereotype that I'm looking for, the samurai warrior, a uh, very masculine, macho uh, idea. Um, and, and that continues to be important in Japanese society. And there is a, a difference in, um, you know, there aren't, there are very few female Japanese executives and, uh, government leaders and things. Whereas in many other countries, uh, females have played a much more prominent role in recent decades. Uh, not nearly the case in Japan. It's changing somewhat, but much more slowly than other countries. Uh, the United States still on the masculine side because of that emphasis on things and materialism. If you look at some of the Scandinavian countries, they would be much lower on that. In fact, they're among the lowest in the world, um, among the most feminine. Uh, so anyway, um, I, I don't know. It's not necessarily well named because it is not exclusively a gender issue. All right, uh, uncertainty avoidance. Um, you can see Japan is much higher on uncertain, uncert, uncertainty avoidance. So risk taking in the United States is more common. We're more comfortable with risk, whereas Japanese in Japanese culture, that would be less comfortable. Um, you, you can look at pragmatism and indulgence. Those are two new ones that were added uh, more recently. Um, there was that I haven't used as much. Um, there's another one that you sometimes see that's called long-term orientation. Um, I don't want to take a lot of time here, but um, pragmatism, for example, has to do with how people in the past as well as how people today relate to the fact that so much that happens around us can't be explained. So kind of a, you know, how comfortable are we with ambiguity or do we need an explanation for everything? Um, and, um, you know, those that have a low score on pragmatism, they need an explanation for everything. Okay, so the United States has a very low score. In fact, of all these things, it's, it's the lowest. We need to know why things happen. And we need an explanation for how things worked together to make this thing happen. We need to know, you know, the nuts and bolts behind something. We want that explanation. We don't want um, to just leave it up to some unknowns. Japan, much, much higher on that. This is a really big gap biggest of all of them. So in Japan, um, there are things that don't need to be explained. There's complexity to life, and it's just complexity. And ha uh, needing to uh, explain all the nuances behind that complexity is not so important. China, for example, on this particular dimension, scores a perfect 100. So it's a, it's a hallmark of some Asian approaches it's not necessary to understand exactly how these processes work or to get to the bottom of things. Um, that you're able to be comfortable um, with it. It's just, it's, again, it's pragmatism because it's very pragmatic to be accepting of those things. You don't have to understand the underlying processes. You don't have to go and influence those processes. Okay, well, I better move along from that taking a lot of time here. Now, a very dangerous thing, though, of the Hofstede approach, so I'm going to go back real quick to that last slide. Um, notice how we have, we've, we've, we've identified different dimensions in culture, but we have used, down in the, in the legend, United States and Japan. We have one number for the United States for power distance. Um, now, that is an average number. So if we survey a thousand different Americans, 
we're going to get a range of responses on power distance. When we average them all together, it comes out to be 31. But if we assume a normal distribution curve, we know that even though everyone's clumping towards 31, we're going to get some people that are much higher on power distance and some people that are much lower on power distance. Now, there are relatively fewer people in the, under those end curves, or the, end, the tails of the curve, but uh, there are people there. Okay, and when we're meeting any particular individual, we don't know right offhand where they fit in that curve, personally. We, we know an average. We know that we're more likely, when we meet an American, that American is more likely to have a low power distance orientation. But there may be Americans that have very high power distance orientations. In fact, there may be plenty of Americans that have higher power distance orientations than the average Japanese person. And so we need to be careful when we're using the nation state as a proxy of culture that we recognize that there are differences. Not everybody in a country is the same. We can't just say the United States is this way, Japan is this way. We have to recognize individual differences within those average differences. And there are several nuances to this. There are certainly between country differences, which we've seen on the averages there, uh, that are useful and instructive. So to know that the average power distance in the United States is different from the average power distance in Japan is useful and instructive. On the other hand, we have to realize that within the countries themselves, there are lots of differences as well. There's lots of variety between people. There could be regional differences. There could be ethnic differences. There could be all kinds of things. So just to say that you are an American doesn't mean that you are going to be the average American. There are lots of not average Americans out there. Okay, I want to illustrate a few... Um, differences in cultural perception here, so we're actually going into our, our kind of uh, art interpretation uh, element of this presentation. Um, these two drawings are of the same individual. Uh, now, um, the person that was the subject of the drawings um, is a Maori chief, okay, a Maori uh, in, native in New Zealand, and so this Maori chief uh, this was in the uh, 18th century um, uh, when the British began to interact with the Maori in New Zealand for the first time. And um, the picture on the left is a Maori chief with his self-portrait. I'm getting a telephone call right now. I'm going to have to pause the lecture here so I can figure out how to do that. All right, um, I think I resumed the recording. I don't know how this is all going to turn out. So this is a wake-up call for you if, uh, if you've fallen asleep. Well, you won't even notice. Um, okay, well, here we are. So hopefully this is working and I'm not just talking without recording. Um, so... Um, this, these portraits, one is a self-portrait, the one on the left is a self-portrait drawn by the Maori chieftain himself. The one on the right is drawn by a um, Englishman who um, was, uh, had, had got to know the chieftain. So the Englishman's interpretation of how this chieftain looks is quite a bit different from how the chieftain sees himself through the self-portrait. Um, now, of course, the tattoos are the prominent feature, and you can notice that in both drawings, the tattoos, there was a lot of uh, thought placed in the tattoos themselves, and they're very, very similar. In fact, the markings are identical. Um, the Maori self-portrait captures those tattoos as the primary feature. The um, English portrait has those tattoos as a very significant feature, it also shows the clothing and the hair and other contextual elements um, of the face in a more realistic way. Um, the markings, the, the tattoo markings, are significant within Maori culture because they designate status, and so the identity of the chieftain is very much tied up in the markings that he has on his face. So, so we can see how there are differences in cultural perceptions. It's also it's even more remarkable uh, when you learn that the um, drawing on the left 
was done completely from memory. The chieftain was not looking in a mirror or anything. He was given a piece of paper and a pen and told to draw himself. And that's what he drew. And uh, that's uh, that was all from memory. So he's very acutely aware of those markings and what they mean. And that is his identity. Um, as opposed to uh, the more realistic um, portrait drawn by the, the Englishman. So again, just very different um, ways of seeing the world that just that, that people are not always emphasizing the same things when they're looking at the same thing. You can be looking at the, the exact same thing and see it in a different way. Uh, this is another example. This is a very famous painting, um, often by a Japanese artist, often referred to as the wave, not the artist. The painting is referred to as the wave, not the artist. Um, what's interesting here is to see what the main um, subject of the painting is. Uh, first of all, since, it's, since we usually refer to it in the West as the wave, we assume, and naturally so, that the wave itself, this large wave in the middle of the painting or slightly to the left of the painting, is the main subject of the painting. But if you look more closely, you can see that actually Mount Fuji is the central focus of the painting. Mount Fuji is in the background for, from a Western perspective, but the whole point here is that the background and foreground issues are very different in terms of Eastern and Western perceptions. Uh, from an Eastern point of view, the background and the foreground are not nearly as separated as from a Western point of view. We focus on the foreground and the background is just at the background. Uh, from the Eastern perspective, the background is central to the painting and orients the whole painting, and the wave is um, just a framing device for the main subject of the painting, which is Mount Fuji. Uh, the other thing to consider is those white dots that go from the wave to Mount Fuji. Now, a Westerner, when asked, and studies have been done on this painting, so Westerners, when asked, asked almost always say that those white dots are spray from the wave. But an Easterner, when asked what are those white dots, will almost always say that is snow falling from the clouds onto Mount Fuji. So again, that clearly represents a difference in how the picture is being perceived. If Mount Fuji is the focus of the painting, then the, the understanding that that's snow falling on Mount Fuji as the central uh, part of the painting is a natural assumption um, to if, if you assume that the painting is really about the wave itself then those dots represent the spray from the wave now you can get into more nuanced arguments about it uh, you can look underneath the wave and the smaller wave the bigger wave on, uh, on the top and the smaller wave on the bottom and they have lots of white dots there too underneath the wave where snow would be very unlikely to um, to be placed um, so a Westerner could argue, again, with our low pragmatism score, we need to understand how these processes work, and we tie it into a scientific view of the world, and we say that couldn't possibly be snow, that has to be spray from the waves, and so the, all of the white dots are spray from the waves, and that's the correct interpretation, has to be. But an Easterner would not, with a high pragmatism score, would say, well, it's not that easy, and no, that doesn't necessarily mean that it couldn't be some of both, or that... There's snow on the mountain, and there's snow under the waves, or whatever. So uh, lots of things that we could look at in that particular picture. Uh, I want to show a few flags. You might recognize this flag, although it's not one. Well, around here we see it occasionally. That's the flag of Washington, D.C. And notice how very linear and structured it is. So it represents a very organized view of the world, a very bureaucratic approach. We're going to put everything in its right spot. We're going to have control of the stars and the stripes and the environment and everything around us. It's all ordered and neat and we are in control. Um, now here's the flag of the state of Arizona, which is heavily influenced uh, by Native American culture. Now Native American culture has much more of the hallmarks of Eastern culture than Western culture, um, at least how we conceive of East and West um, today, the, the more European focused versus the more Asian focused. So um, Native American culture tends to be uh, have more similarities with the Asian view. Um, and you can see that here, things are not so neat 
and they're certainly organized and straight, but in a different kind of way. The star is the center of the orientation, and everything else comes out from there. The person who is looking at this is not organizing the star and the field around the star, but becomes just a part of this bigger environment. Whereas with the DC flag, the person is placing his or her expectation of organization into that symbol. Um, here, the person in the Arizona flag is more a part of the context and the fiber of the of the whole um, of the whole depiction. Instead of governing it, it's you're you're being governed by it in a sense. Um, and then another comparison here, even more stark, is the New Mexico flag, also influenced by Native culture, Native American culture. And here it's much more stylized, and the sun is the central focus. And even though there are very clear lines there, um, it, it's clear that everything else is part of the field, and it's only the sun that is the central focus, and all is orienting out from the sun. So um, it's just this different way of perceiving the environment. The sun at the center of things rather than being something that's just a part of a bigger picture. Okay, what are some implications then for all of these cultural issues and cross-cultural um, problems and, and differences that we've been exploring here? Well, um, Howard Moskowitz is a uh, marketing researcher. Um, he is credited with um, a number of breakthroughs in understanding of, of how customers think. Um, he was commissioned to do a study for Pepsi and made this particular comment after he concluded his study. He said, there is not a perfect Pepsi, there are perfect Pepsis. And what he meant by that was that you know uh, Pepsi was looking for the perfect formula. So uh, they had developed a number of different formulas and they wanted Moskowitz to test these on people and do some statistical analysis to see which was the most favored formula so that they could adopt it as, as, the, as their drink and increase their sales. Moskowitz found that uh, different people preferred different things, that there was variation um, in people's preferences, and if you were to select the one that happened to be preferred most, it would alienate many other potential customers um, because it only appealed to a relatively small group, even though it got the most positive views, um, it's still only one part of the broader marketplace. And what he found was that people's preferences were clustering along different characteristics so that um, you would get a certain group of people that really preferred number one, Pepsi number one, and another group that really preferred number two and, and so forth. And so for each individual, there is a perfect Pepsi out there, uh, but it's not necessarily the same as the next individual so that our tastes and preferences, which are culturally rooted often, um, are not always aligned. And going for the average, like in the, um, in the Hofstede example, going for the average is not necessarily our best approach. Understanding those nuances, whether it's nuances across cultures or within cultures, is going to be important for the business person. We are going to have to adapt our products to meet the varied expectations of customers coming from very different kinds of backgrounds with different types of preferences. Okay, so the translation here is that one size does not fit all. It would be dangerous to take that approach and that this applies both across cultures and it even applies within cultures. All right, well, another thing that we need to think of in terms of, a, uh, impl of an implication here is the existence of unconscious cultural bias. So we may feel very good about ourselves. We may say, "Hey, um, you know, I have ha had lot of, a lot of experience uh, working across cultures with different kinds of people. I strategize before my encounters to make sure that I can enhance my ability to communicate effectively across cultural boundaries. Um, I adapt uh, based on the feedback that I'm getting, and the, uh, both verbal and nonverbal. And and I feel pretty good. I have a deep cultural knowledge of certain cultures." And, I feel pretty good about my ability to effectively communicate, but um, all of us 
are open to unconscious cultural bias. Um, and there's a, an interesting study going on at Harvard that is looking at this. And uh, the other day, I, I went and, and did some of their tests. I encourage you to do the same. They're, they have about 10 or 12 uh, different tests take about 10 or 15 minutes to complete each one. So you don't don't do all of them, but pick one that seems interesting. And um, it does a number of different comparisons, and it, it's an online tool that uh, at the end of, of the test, it will tell you if you have or to what extent you have an unconscious cultural bias along that dimension. Um, so I encourage you to do that, see what you can learn from that. Um, the question that comes to mind is, if you do have these unconscious biases, then how can you avoid them, or how can you avoid having them uh, have a negative impact on what you're doing, or reduce your ability to be sensitive across cultures or to communicate effectively? And that's something I want you to ponder. Uh, I don't have answers for you right now on that, but think about it, and, um, and I'm sure there are things that you can come up with that would help you. Um, I mean, certainly... You need, I can't just leave a question hanging like that when I'm here talking to myself. Um, certainly there are things that you could do. Um, usually it would, it would have to do with becoming more aware of what those biases might be in your particular case and being sensitive. Once we're aware of the bias, it's no longer unconscious. It's not necessarily a bad thing to have a bias. It's just bad to let that bias uh, control uh, everything that we do when that bias may actually be unfounded or may cause us some difficulties if, if we allow ourselves to be governed by that bias. Um, so making the unconscious bias into a conscious bias would be the first step to be able to control it. Once we know what our conscious biases are, then we're able to um, work with them a little bit more and then uh, overcome them when necessary. All right, I'm going to conclude with one final example here another cultural miscue. So if you look at this picture, and this is uh, something that, that I just saw today, uh, it was an article um, on a new restaurant that Yum! Brands, the same company that owns uh, Pizza Hut and KFC and Taco Bell, um, they are looking to introduce some new concepts in fast food in the United States. This happens to be in Dallas, Texas. So they have created this new concept restaurant called the Bon Shop, B-A-H-N. It's a little bit hard to read from that sign. B-A-H-N, Bon Shop. Actually, it looks like it's B-A-N-H. That's how I'm seeing it right now. Um, anyway, it, I know it's the Bon Shop, so maybe it is B-A-N-H. Anyway, uh, it's Vietnamese street food is the theme of this. It's a fast food location. And notice the construction of the building and everything. It's it's uh, it's pretty cool. They I mean they have like a garage door is the the uh, door that you walk in, and so it's open like having a street like environment. And uh, you go in there, and, and they're serving traditional Vietnamese dishes that you would find uh, on the streets of Saigon. Um, so so they call it Saigon Street Food is the subtitle of the restaurant. So Bon Shop Saigon Street Food. All right, we'll look at that and. Um, what about that might be culturally controversial? I'll give you a second to think about that. Okay, because it is, I'll give you a clue, it is culturally controversial, and many Vietnamese have complained about this restaurant. All right, well, what they're complaining about is the star. This is a red star being used as the logo of the bond shop. Now, um, why is that offensive? Well, because in the United States, the Vietnamese immigrants that are in the United States, those that uh, came as refugees from Vietnam back in the, um, well, starting in the, maybe even as early as the late 60s through the 1970s during the Vietnam War and during that period of communist rule in Vietnam, um, they are very sensitive to connotations of communism and they don't want Vietnam to be associated with those communist ideology ideologies. Um, so using that red star prominently there is offensive to them because they have distanced themselves politically and culturally from that communist past. So it's a historical problem 
and, and it's also an ideological problem. They don't want the ideology of communism associated with their food, their traditional food that might be served on the streets of Saigon. So, um, and things have changed dramatically in Vietnam. Uh, it's still technically a communist country, but it's communist in a much looser way than even China. Um, well, China's politically very strongly communist, of course, but economically not so. Uh, Vietnam is even looser in that regard, and, and it really could not be considered a communist country by any uh, strong definition today. Um, so, so anyway, that's just an example of how Yum Brands um, did not anticipate that this would be culturally offensive to the very people for which um, it's not that they're trying to appeal to those people specifically, though that's not their main customer group, but that's a customer group that's very invested in their depiction of that culture and does not want to see that red star there. So Yum Brands actually agreed to change the logo. They're going to come up with something different. I can understand why they would put it there and why those associations exist, uh, whether they are a result of unconscious bias or whether it was a conscious decision to link it with that uh, kind of a, a gritty communist past as part of this Saigon street food. It kind of gives it an edge, a bit of an edge that they might have been looking for. I, I can see how conceptually that would work, but, um, but they didn't anticipate that it would be offensive to uh, Vietnamese immigrants and that that would cause a backlash. So now they're changing it. Um, another thing that this illustrates, though, in a cultural sense, is the degree to which we are much more open to all kinds of cultural mixing now than we have been in the past. Um, I would say the fact that Yum Brands, a major American fast food company, of course they have a global presence and they're used to operating in many different countries, but um, the fact that they would introduce a Vietnamese street food concept as a new fast food restaurant concept in Dallas, Texas, and with plans to roll it out for the entire United States, represents a quite a significant degree of cultural mixing. The anticipation that a mainstream U.S. customer, U.S. Um, consumer, would be interested in Vietnamese street food uh, on a regular basis is an indication of how far we have come culturally to be accepting to all kinds of different foods and ideas and influences from around the world. Um, frankly, I would love to go eat at the Saigon or at the Bond shop, have some Saigon street food. Um, I would love for one of these to come here to central Pennsylvania. Maybe somebody should open one up here in Shippensburg. Now, are we ready for it here in Shippensburg? I don't know, but they probably are ready for it in Dallas, and I'm sure there are many places around the country where this would be very successful as a concept, showing much more openness to cross-cultural interaction. All right, well, I'm going to conclude with that then. I apologize for the length of this lecture. Hopefully you hung in with it and hopefully it recorded properly. Um, so thanks for sticking with me.